Hey, I'm Kathy. So I get requests all the time for different types of videos. And one of the requests I got was to make a video about what it's like to go through a code blue situation. So I've been a nurse now for almost three years and I've probably been involved in say a half a dozen code blue situations. I am less involved now that I'm a wound nurse, but as a new grad, um, and actually before that, I was involved. So when I was in nursing school, I worked as a transporter um, part-time to kind of have my foot in the door to try to get a, uh, a new grad position when I graduated. So as a transporter, I responded to a code blue with my fellow transporter, Gabe, and um, I decided I was going to try to get in there and do CPR um, with Gabe and others. So um, transporters often respond to code blues if they are not otherwise occupied um, and really busy um, with other transports. So, um, so Gabe and I went into the room and we started alternating with CPR on the patient, which when I took my CPR classes, um, it didn't seem like too big of a deal to do CPR, um, not super tiring. Well, I'm here to tell you that it is exhausting. It is beyond exhausting. So I'm I'm in pretty good shape. I work out at the gym a couple times a week. I run. Um, I'm actually, I consider myself in decent shape. But I tell you what, doing CPR was exhausting. The other issue was that I'm short, like I'm five foot two, and so, um, I was kind of doing my CPR at an angle slightly, and I really just made my neck super sore for like a couple weeks. Um, I could have gotten on top of the patient, like straddled the patient and done it like that, and that would have been much better form. Um, the issue with like getting on top of your patient, like if you're alone, it's your patient, or you found the patient and there's no one there yet, the do what you got to do, right? Get on there and, and straddle the patient and do that. But once others respond to the code blue and come to try to help, you're kind of in the way if you're on the patient's lap um, because they're trying to place electrodes and pads and, um, you know, give them IV um, therapies, etc. So that doesn't work that great. So the other option is you could try to find a stool um, to get yourself up higher and get a better angle. Um, that wasn't readily available to me um, during my first code blue. So when we were alternating, um, typically you would do it for like two minutes and have the other person come in and do it for two minutes um, and alternate every two minutes. But honestly, it was wiping me out. So I would look back at Gabe and Gabe would end up doing it like three minutes and then I would do it one minute. So um, I learned from that, um, that if there are people who want to do the CPR, like these big guys from transport or wherever, who are, um, some people are like super into it and want to get in there and do that. That's awesome. I let them do that because honestly, they're going to be able to provide CPR a whole lot better than I am. I mean, I was really diligent about making sure I was going fast enough and going deep enough. And again, you're using that, like, you know, staying alive. That's, at least that's what I'm singing in my mind to make sure I'm keeping pace. Um, but other people are just more effective at it and do not tire as quickly as me. So from that one episode, I figured that my role in a code blue should probably not be CPR if there are others there that can do it and do it more effectively. So that was my um, one experience before I became a nurse. Um, after I became a nurse, like in my new grad period, um, I was working nights, which, oh, can't handle nights. But anyway, I was there for five months and we had a number of code blue situations at night, which gave me some really good experience. So when you, I'm going to talk about two different scenarios here. If it's your patient versus if it's someone else's patient. So it's always great to get experience on someone else's patient if possible, before you have to kind of manage a code blue on your own patient. So if you're helping out with a code blue on another patient that is not your patient, 
the first thing you want to make sure is that someone is handling your patients. So you just need to ask your resource or mentor RN to kind of keep an eye on your patients or a fellow nurse so that their needs are not neglected while you're helping with this other patient in a code blue situation. Um, once you have that covered, then you can go in and try to help. So there's a number of ways you can help. Um, if you're super in shape um, and ready to do some CPR, then sure, go in there and help with the CPR. That will be um, more than welcome. But if you're like me, um, and that's maybe not the, the skills that you can best um, present to the team, there are other things you can do. One is you can kind of be on the outside of the room and help fetch supplies as needed. So when they need an IV start kit, they need um, different supplies, you could run to the supply room or run to the med room and get those supplies um, for the team. Um, the other thing, the other way you can contribute, and this is how I like to contribute, is when there's a code blue, they'll bring in the crash cart, right? They're gonna bring in the crash cart, they're gonna put leads on the patient, they're gonna put pads on the patient. Um, in that crash cart, there should be a notebook. And in that notebook is where you document exactly what time what happened. Um, when was the patient found? When were CPR, um, when was CPR initiated? When um, did we check the pulse? What was the um, heart rate and blood, you know, if they got their pulse back, obviously. Um, but what was their blood pressure? Um, what time did we infuse, um, you know, give them an epi? What time did we give them, um, you know, bicarb, if that's something that we're doing? So when I was involved in Code Blue as a new nurse, I would grab that notebook and I would kind of be like one of the organizers in terms of making sure I have all the data down on the notebook. So um, I would write the time, the exact time, and just confirm. Did you put one milligram of epi? Yes, okay, I put that in there. Okay, what was, um, you know, what's their rhythm? What time did we deliver a shock? You know, and I put that there. So basically you have this running log of exactly what was done at exactly what time so they can review that because there's definitely gonna be a whole report and process of reviewing um, a code blue situation. So I just found that that was um, my comfortable area where I like to um, contribute. I'm good at kind of calling out and organizing things and so having that notebook was a good way for me to contribute. So if it is um, your patient though, um, if you find them and you, you need to call the code and you may need to do some CPR and stuff until people respond. Um, but once people respond and are taking over CPR, it's best if, if you're the nurse, the primary nurse, that you are there and can explain to all these people who are going to descend upon your room um, the patient's situation. So the people who will descend upon the room um, when you have a code blue, Usually um, there'll be a critical care doctor, there'll be ICU nurses, lab will show up, um, as well as a, you know, a lot of other resources. So you need to be there to give a really clear report to the doctors and nurses who are coming to um, intervene. You need to let them know how old the patient is, what, he, what the patient came in for, um, what their status was this morning, when it started to deteriorate, um, when the patient was found, what meds they're on, when you gave medications, um, when you last assessed them, and what was you know their appearance and concerns, that type of thing. So when it's your patient, it's best that you're available to do those things and not be in there doing CPR or doing the notebook or anything else. You need to be kind of um, the informant to everybody who is involved. So um, I had to do this. Um, one of my patients um, was a full code and um, ended up code blue. They actually ended up passing. In most situations, um, CPR um, in the end is often not effective. Like you may bring them back for a little bit, but ultimately um, there's a high likelihood that they will pass. Um, sometimes we are able to bring people back and that's awesome, um, but it's not the um, most common case that you're able to save the patient. So I hope that helps to know what to expect. So when you find a patient, you wanna call the code. So 
definitely when you um, are a new employee there, a new nurse, you need to figure out what number you dial to get the code or if there's a button on the wall you can hit to call a code, you need to definitely know that. So you wanna call the code, do the CPR, if there's no pulse, um, until others arrive, and then start coordinating care and communicating to others. Um, and then those ICU nurses and critical care doctors and everybody else will kind of take over for you. And then you're kind of running interference um, potentially with the family. So in my situation, um, I had a female patient um, who coded and her husband, you know, we, we um, called the husband. I actually had my um, resource mentor nurse call the family because I was giving updates to the doctor. So this is where you definitely rely on your fellow nurses, your mentor nurse, your resource nurse to help do things for you. You're kind of delegating. And so she called the family. The family kind of rushed in. Um, it was not a good scene. He was super upset about his wife's situation and, um, and ended up really blaming uh, the doctor and myself for not giving her good care in his opinion, which was really not the case. We did a lot. And, um, but that was really, really difficult to hear. And you just need to be prepared for that kind of reaction from family. Um, cause they're grieving and they will, um, in a lot of cases lash out at you as a nurse and the other staff. So that was tough as a new grad. Um, to hear that and I did spend a little time in the bathroom crying <laughs> and a little time outside crying um, I had a hard time with it after like I in the moment I was like calm getting through it but when she passed and um, and I had kind of that let down it was tough and I really for my sanity I had to go home and make um, kind of a document list out kind of my day and what went down to kind of reassure myself that I did everything I could have done. Um, like when I assessed her, when I gave meds, my concerns, when I called the doctor, you know, it was kind of a slow progression downward for this particular patient. So I, I kind of documented all that just for my own sake. And I actually provided a report to um, the administration at my hospital too um, regarding the events of the day. That helped me. That just helped me understand that, yes, I did everything I could do and it was not my fault despite, you know, the family's reaction to it. So um, just be aware of kind of the emotional ramifications of going through a code blue, particularly if it's your patient and particularly if a, a family member lashes out at you. Um, so anyway. That's my um, video. I hope it's helpful to give you a feel for the different roles during a code blue, um, what you need to do if it's your patient or not your patient, how family may respond. Hopefully that will give you um, a little glimpse, um, but when you're a new nurse, you'll experience it and you'll see firsthand. And um, if you have any other suggestions or comments, feel free to um, leave those on the video. Thanks so much for watching.